or good evening, everybody. Um, I, uh, Tammy and her family and me and some of my colleagues are here on the other side of the world. We've been teaching and educating. Um, gosh, I was in Bali and you and your husband were somewhere else. And then I was in, and then we were in Singapore teaching for almost a week. And now we're in Thailand talking to folks about treatment centers. And it is possible that we're going to have a program here overseas for the folks in Australia and New Zealand and, and uh, this side of the world. It's not Even fair to yeah. only have the work we do in the Americas. Right. So it's time. And I think we have an opportunity to do that. So I'm excited about that because I have many friends in this part of the world. Uh, hi, my name is Rob. I'm a sex addict. I'm also a... Uh, uh, I, uh, entered, I entered the Rooms of Recovery in 1985. I've been at this a long time. Um, and then somewhere in the late 80s, I went to grad school and started this work. And I've been writing and teaching and growing programs and doing therapy ever since. Um, very grateful to be a part of a team that includes Tammy uh, Verhelst, who is our director of, of, of relationships. I can't think of a better way to put it. <laughs> and because uh, she is the relationship person. Tammy is here in particular because when you reach out, you want to talk to me, you have questions, you want to, Tammy's the person you're going to talk to, um, and she'll write you back. She'll often send you information about finding a therapist or getting feedback or reading a book or whatever it is that you ask about. We're going to do our best to provide the resource. Um, just to say it, this is a free service that we provide. Um, there are a number of webinars that go on, and I think if you're a subscriber or you're on our site, you can find them. Um, it's my goal uh, to have this organization that Tammy and I and others are involved with uh, to offer as much information, support, education, and, um, and uh, community as we can for you to support each other. And if you get on the list of webinars, there's now some drop-in groups, there's some educational forums, there's all kinds of stuff, as we promised, beginning to happen and all at no charge. Um, also, I just want to say there is a podcast called Sex, Love, and Addiction. I think we've completed, completed something like 25 of them. So, And I have been able to gather experts from all over the world and some good friends to talk there um, with me about all different aspects of recovery and infidelity and sex and relationship addiction, compulsivity. Um, and we're here just to answer questions and support you. There's no charge. There's no fee. Um, the only thing we ask is that you spread the word. If you can let people know that we're doing this, if you can let people know that there's a place for them to go, that they can anonymously, if they wish, find out questions about sex, love, and relationship, addiction, and healing, um, that would be a gift to us. So anyway, welcome uh, to, from us in Thailand, and um, uh, I would love to answer your questions, so let's get started. Okay, first question. I'm a female who had a long-term affair. My male partner gets the sexual addiction I have. It's been 18 months post-discovery. He's discovered, or he's struggled with hurt heart, understandably due to the trauma he has experienced. He struggles with, will it ever get better? Thoughts. Well, um, I think all partners struggle. Um, whoops, oh, there we go. Um, so I work with a lot of couples and have over the years who deal with infidelity and sex addiction is a more profound form of infidelity because there's so much more of it and it, and it speaks more to, I think infidelity and cheating, uh, if it's occasional or rare, to me speaks of a kind of immaturity in the person. But if it's more profound and it's more of an addiction or a compulsion, it speaks to a greater brokenness in us, you know. So um, I can understand, you know, that he is worried that, um, that you're going to in some way run off the rails and betray him. Um, I do, though, think that 18 months is a kind of long time for him to be, um, I don't know to what degree he is fearful, but generally when couples are actively working on, on um, recovering from betrayal, by around the year mark, there tends to be a bit of a change, a, a sense of uh, hopefulness and we're beginning to come together. So I would say if that's not happening, and I don't mean to... Um, say this is what you specifically need to do in general, I think a good couples therapy session or two would be really worthwhile because if things aren't getting better and they're just sort of stagnating, maybe there are things that aren't being said. Maybe there are feelings he has. Maybe there's something he found that's bugging him that you never talked about. Maybe he wants some kind of reassurance from you that you haven't been able to give him. So there's my sense is there's something going on that is unspoken. And, um, 
The other piece is, and this is for all of the men and women who are trying to heal their relationships, is that, you know, um, a lot of how your partner is going to heal will depend on you. If you are showing up for your family, if you're being responsible and accountable, if you're telling the truth, if you're, you know, uh, going to therapy or going to 12-step meetings or doing whatever you need to do, um, if you're being a fully accountable, available partner who's transparent, um, like partner should be anyway, um, but for us, a little bit more work at it, he should be feeling that work and gaining trust in you. I do want to say, though, and as the last thing, that um, when you when you break basic trust, when someone believes in you utterly and you believe in them and they really think you're going to be faithful because that's what you've committed to um, and haven't gone back to renegotiate, that is what you've committed to, um, and then you break their trust, the relationship will never be the same. And, and you both have to accept that. The sense for him that I can uh, trust her utterly Early, that she would never let me down, that she would never do something that she knows would hurt me. Well, you have, and you've done it probably more than once. And so he has a, a um, it's important for him to be able to understand that you're not the person that he thought you were, because you're not, um, and that he has to adapt to a new reality, which may or may not be what he wants. And all of these things I think are best talked about either if you guys are really able to take the time time and make the time that's committed on a regular basis to talking about these difficult issues and you're saying to him your concerns. If not, you know, it's worth um, spending a little less Christmas money and getting a really good couples therapist just for three or four sessions just to see if you can get through this piece. Um, I hope that's helpful. And by the way, Tammy can recommend people anywhere in the world. So we're pretty good at that if you want a couples therapist. And there are less uh betrayed partners for males um, groups, but there are some. So yes, if you, if you reach out and ask me about that, I can put you in contact with that. I, you don't indicate what, um, what resources for support he's had, uh, but you know, as Rob often is talking about, we really do heal in community. And so he, having other men who have, have had the same kind of situation uh, to be able to heal with, you know, I think would be really helpful. So, well, and, and I'll even throw it out that I, I used to do partner portrayed partners groups that are mixed gender because, you know, you're not the sex addicts. You're not going to hit on each other. You're not going to do all. And so, uh, this betrayal group, and he has been betrayed. It's really powerful for the women. Rob, you're freezing. I don't know if the rest of you are experiencing that, but his, I'm gonna text him. You froze. There, okay, you're back. So say the last piece again, so. Oh, I just said that you pros. men, men all, I, I think Tammy, when our, when we freeze, we both freeze. So, and folks, again, I just want those of you who are just joining us, Tammy and I are in Thailand, um, looking at opening a program here. Um, and so if it becomes a little unstable, the connection, just hang in there. I'm sure the, the, you know, all, with all the gods that are here, certainly it will come back. Mm -hmm. Um, what I was saying finally is I think men do, men do well in a women's betrayal group or in a general betrayal group where there are a bunch of women. It's great for the women, sadly, but true to see that a man can be betrayed and the man will identify so much with a woman's sense of betrayal. So it can be very useful. Okay, next question. I'm familiar, Phil, I'm sorry, I'm familiar with the concept of eroticized rage and would like to know how it develops. Like any other sex addicts, I tend to sexualize my feelings. When I'm feeling lonely, stressed out, disappointed, sad, and even happy, I get the urge to act out sexually. I am beginning to understand that these sexual urges are not, uh, are, are not our normal and natural human need to be sexual with someone, but rather unmet emotional needs that are manifesting themselves in sexual ways. My question is, how did this sexualization of emotions develop in the first place? Did it develop because I conditioned myself by sexually acting out whenever I was experiencing a negative emotion over time? My brain becomes wired by associating negative emotions with sexually acting out like a Pavlovian conditioning. I might have just answered that question. So <laughs> but would like some information. Okay. 
And thanks, Mary, for the suggestion. Someone mentioned that we'd only froze, that I was the only one who froze. Um, okay, so that was about 12 questions in one. I'm gonna skip the eroticized rage one because I, I think that it's better to look at emotions in general. And here's the deal. Um, I'll give you the, the full 911 on, on, the, on why we sexualize our emotions. Um, it's because we learned, we learned to. Um, in early childhood, probably somewhere between zero and four, if there's trauma, if there's abuse, if there's neglect, um, and trauma is not just sexual, it can be neglect, it can be, um, it can be an overly anxious parent, it can be a, an abandoning parent, it can be all kinds of things. <clears throat> there can be violence or mental illness in the family, addiction. Sometimes we don't even know because what happened, because it can happen before we really have a lot of memory. But when young children experience trauma, they don't really have a great ability to manage that. They don't, especially, the only thing they can do is really two things. They can either reach out to a person or they can go somewhere in their head that makes them feel better. And if the people who are your caregivers don't leave you feeling safe when you're little, or if you don't feel safe in general when you're little for whatever reasons, you're gonna to learn to go into fantasy as a means of feeling better. And so, you know, people space out, look out the window, people watch TV, people get into, into books, they disappear for periods of time into an activity that makes them feel better. I used to read and read and read and read and read, but I didn't read like a normal kid. I read because I needed to escape mom and dad screaming in the next room. And I can read so well that when I'm reading, if people are talking in the room, I mean, I just completely disappear more than most people. That ability to disappear into fantasy as a way of feeling better becomes a coping mechanism later in life as we grow. Healthy people learn really early and then continue over time to turn to people when they're in profound distress and they may use fantasy and dissociation and when they're in mild distress you might find yourself distracted missing a subway exit or a freeway exit that is dissociation or fantasy spacing out for healthy people but we space out when we feel emotionally stressed and the answer is always for us to turn to people because healthy people, when they're stressed, turn to people. Uh, hey, I had a bad day, something, bad, uh, something difficult was going on with me, and they get support and feedback. We tend to disappear into isolation and trying to make ourselves feel better. Um, by the way, children are, just one little more piece, children do have sexual feelings. And those of you who are parents know that you may have seen little Johnny or little Mary touching themselves in Target. And you had to say, hey, honey, don't do that in public. You know, children do have that part, those parts feel good. And so if you are a hurting child, you might touch yourself in a genital place to make yourself feel better. And you're also going to be in fantasy. So sexuality, sensuality, the use of fantasy and, and positive um, dissociation to get out of what I'm dealing with as a child becomes a way of coping that is burned in deep in the back of the brain. And once you're seven or eight, that's pretty much burned in. So you may not even, as I don't know sometimes why I feel like sexually acting out, but when I trace it back, I can usually figure it, figure it out. For me, it often has to do with abandonment or anxiety. The last thing I want to say is in some, on some way, manner, it doesn't really matter what you're feeling in the moment. What you need to pay attention to is the fact that you want to act out. Um, make sure that you take care of yourself in that moment and get yourself to someone and say, hey, you don't have to tell them you feel like acting out, but hey, I'm struggling today. And could we chat? I guarantee you with half an hour of chatting, you won't want to act out anymore. It's the, the challenge for us is getting past the, oh, I want to have sex to, oh, I feel like having sex, but that must mean that I'm struggling emotionally. And it's not just that I'm horny, you know, because that's what we used to think, but that wasn't true. So hopefully that's helpful. Next, next question, three months into recovery, the husband, sex addict, still struggling with honesty and respecting relationship boundaries. Therapist has told my husband that if I request to look at his phone, he he is willingly allow me to see he is very secretive about his cell phone to the point of even taking it to the bathroom with him anytime i walk behind him he's hitting a button and to fling it to the home screen when i ask to see his phone and he loses it um as in the last time he got so enraged he whipped the phone at me 
immediately went off on us never going to be able to work because I am the crazy one and need to get over it already. He's not hiding anything. Special note, every time I have seen his phone, there's either a conversation with people he isn't supposed to be talking to or else apps back on there that he isn't supposed to have, Snapchat, etc. He's on to the point where that if I break down crying, he comments like, get over it. You're not getting pity for me. You're the one that caused this. Uh, so... Okay, well, I don't know you at all, but I'll just tell you in a situation like that, what I would say to any woman, you're being abused. Um, you're being verbally abused. You're being physically abused. The man threw something at you. Um, and he's unstable. Um, and he's not in I recovery. Think, he, sorry. Right. This is, not, this is not how people act when they are committed to wanting to heal. Um, what I was be questioning if, if if he was in recovery is why would he be with you if he's so unhappy and treating you that way? Um, this is not so. Let me tell you what recovery looks like. It's willingness. It's openness. Uh, if I had, if I was your husband and I was doing these things, I would turn to you and say, "Look, I want you back. I want this to work. You're important to me. Our family's important to me, and I have nothing to hide. You know what I've done. Here's my phone. Look at it whenever you want." And I would do that not because I felt great that you were looking at my stuff or that I, you didn't trust me enough to uh, not look at it. I wouldn't feel good about that, but I would let you do it and, and gladly so because I want you to trust me. I want you to um, believe me because I want to rebuild our relationship. You're, this man is hiding. And for whatever reasons, he's not only keeping you out, but he's keeping you out with a shove. And I'm more worried about the fact that he is verbally abusive to you and is, you know, to the point of sort of like explosive. And then when you are actually hurting, he's being more abusive to you. So I don't hear any, not only, this is not a relationship where I don't, this is not a relationship where I hear someone who needs to take a few turns and do a little bit of work to be a better partner. This is someone who is in denial about the depth of pain that he's caused you and probably is still playing with the game. Here's the deal. You got to trust your feelings. I say this to every partner. You, you know, we will say to you, the sex act, oh, you're making too big a deal out of this. You've got to get over it. You, forget that. You know in your heart that this man would be treating you right and would be open and honest. And if, if he wanted you to, um, uh, if he didn't have something to hide. So I think you should trust your feelings. I, I don't know your situation. So I can't tell you, go move out and go stay with your sister. Although that's what I would do. Um, I can't tell you that you need to find a way to get him into treatment or take yourself to get some care. I, I don't know your situation, what you can afford, what's available to you. But I will tell you as a therapist that what I hear. Sorry, he froze a moment, so. He hopefully will come right back. I mean, you're and now you're back. So I will tell you as a therapist and then finish the sentence. Um, I will tell you as a therapist that what he's doing is not acceptable. And, um, and it certainly has nothing to do with recovery. Um, I don't know what you have available to you as a resource because I don't know you. But if, if you have any resources available to get yourself some help, go see a professional, figure out how to do an intervention on this man, you know, or some kind of, uh, or put yourself in safety. You are not emotionally safe with this man in the way that he is acting. And you are responding in a way that is perfectly healthy to what the way you're being treated. I this is completely unacceptable and in no way an expression of recovery. So if it were me, I'd get out, get out, get out, or get in, get in, get in with somebody who can help you and confront him. You're not safe with him. And certainly emotionally, you are not, if it were me and I had to be around him, I would shut off my emotions because I would not want to be vulnerable with someone who's going to abuse me. But I would turn to my friends and my family and my therapist and my faith to get support because this man is not going to support you. He's not supporting himself. Um, and ultimately, I don't know if I'd be able to stay in a situation. I would not allow myself to stay in a situation like that or have my kids see something like that. Yeah, because honestly, they're, they're 
little, they pick up everything. So they, um, Can you right. be, Tammy, who picks up everything? Can you, children, that's important. Those children, yeah. I, right. So my personal situation, I was in a not great relationship and I had a young daughter and I thought, this is not what I want to model as a healthy relationship for my child. Right. And I ultimately left that relationship because he was unwilling to change. I was willing to change, but he was unwilling to change. So, so one of my primary concerns was what am I doing ultimately you know, to my child? So, so that was a, a key factor for me and they pick up and, everything. So. And, and I want to, and maybe one more thing, and this is for everybody, you know, I encourage every spouse who loves an addict to stay. You know, I wrote a book about this called pro dependence. I think we do better together, but I only think we do better together if both partners are committed to healing. And if this man is not committed to healing, then you're just going to be suffering abuse because you're holding up your truth and he's smacking it down. And that's abusive. Okay. Yeah, a, con a continuation of that one, um, which I think you can probably just touch on this is um, if she asks, if she says to him, I'm not feeling loved or appreciated, he will say, I'm not going to show you appreciation if you just asked for it. So, well, I know. I mean, that's very sad to me because, first of all, you should be appreciated just because you just because you exist and because someone loves you and they're with you. I tell my husband every day how much I value him, appreciate him, love him, even when I think he's a jerk. <laughs> I'll say, but I still love you. Um, but to say to someone that, that you're committed to, hey, I need something from you, and for them to say you don't deserve it is abusive. That is abusive. You know, I, I, I don't mean to get a little strict with the women in this room, but I want to get a little strong here. This is me too stuff. This is me too. When you've been harmed and let down and lied to and manipulated and um, had vows broken and someone says, well, you just need to put up with it or get over it. It's like that boss saying, I'm going to pinch your butt and you just got to live with it. It's not okay. Love doesn't mean abuse. If you're in a relationship where that person is willing to, has hurt you, has let you down, has broken the back of your relationship, but is willing to do everything they can to make it right, it, even if they don't do it perfectly, it's worth a try. But boy, if somebody is distant, abusive, negative, blaming, devaluing, A, they're probably still acting out, and B, because they're pushing you away, and B, you don't deserve that. So how can you do the best to take care of yourself and make sure that the message gets across that you are not willing to put up with that? Okay. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to women adopting a sex positive philosophy with the idea that women can take back control of their bodies in a feminist kind of way. I actually use this as a rationale, but now I realize that I am actually a sex and love addict. Can non-addicts really take on this philosophy? Well, here's the thing. Um, so T Tam and I are a good example. And by the way, guys, Tammy and I are not partners. Tammy has a husband, I have a husband, and they're different. <laughs> um, and so, um, just so you know, we travel on the world and do, we love each other, we're great friends, but um, this is not romantic mm -hmm. just to say it, but we do share a lot of views. Um, now that I said that, I don't remember the question. <laughs> uh, the, the sex positive philosophy with the idea that oh. women can take back control of their bodies, yes. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, uh, the, the reason I brought up Tammy now, I remember, Tammy is an alcoholic and she talks about that openly here and I am not. So when I go out to dinner, if I wanna have a couple glasses of wine, if I wanted to get drunk, as long as I wasn't driving, it's my business, who cares? I don't drink that much, no problem. However, Tammy at the same table doesn't get the same option. Even though she could drink, she, is, she chooses not to because she knows that for her, her relationship with alcohol is gonna bring her down. And for me, it's just gonna make me a little sleepy or maybe have a headache the next day and then I'm not gonna drink again for a month. So we have a different relationship with alcohol. That's just how we're built. Yes, sex positive, wonderful. Women, take power. Sleep with who you want to. As long as it's safe, grab Tinder and go for it. You know, I have no conservative views on sexuality. I'm a gay man, you know. But if you're a sex addict, you have to have sex differently. You have to approach relationships differently. It's like Tammy with her drinking. You don't get to be like every other feminist out there who's, woo, let me take charge of my sex life. You have to take charge of it in a way that commits to a much more narrow set of behaviors because 
because you have a problem, because you're broken in this area, and you have to be very careful about how you conduct yourself. It has nothing to do with liberal or, pardon me, conservative or right or wrong or morality or any of that. It has to do with the fact that for you, when you engage in certain behaviors, you run off the rails. There's nothing wrong with alcohol, period. It's been a social bond. It's in the Bible. It's part of how we celebrate. But for some of us, we just can't drink. And there's a nothing wrong with sex. Procreational, recreational, investigational, go for it. Unless you're a sex addict or a sexual compulsive, which means you have certain internal emotional issues that require you to be much more judicious about your sexual choices. And that's a bummer, but it's the way it is. Agree. So new question. The triangle of shame, guilt, and remorse for the female sex love addict. I'm moving through 12-step recovery. Sometimes the shame felt as a result of my affair sex addiction is suffocating. Well, um, a couple of things. Um, I learned this about shame. Uh, a therapist told me this, and I'm going to share it with you. It's one of my favorite statements about one of my favorite thoughts about shame, which is that when you are in a place of shame, th uh, this is about shame, and then I'll answer your question. Um, when you're in a place of deep self-hatred and shame, whoops, I faded out again, didn't I? There we go. When you're in a place of deep self-hatred and shame, there's no there there. You can sit for hours with, oh my God, I'm awful, I'm terrible, I can't, you know, and, and really, and I mean this in the most loving way, that's kind of like more about you. You know, when I hate myself, I'm not being generous with other people. I'm not looking out for them. I'm not thinking of others. I'm really just obsessing about how horrible I am. Male or female, right or wrong, we make mistakes. And some of us have a little bit of brokenness. I have not met in 25 years of treating sex addicts more than five people who were so um, sociopathic that they were, I would consider them like bad people. The, the, in other words, so broken that they hurt people deliberately. The other 995 people that I've worked with, or couples or whatever, were people who had problems and they acted out those problems with sex and love, but they didn't want to screw up their sex lives. They didn't want to humiliate themselves. They didn't want to have a history that made them feel badly about themselves. It's just where they landed because of the history they have. So when you feel like, God, I'm the worst of the worst, two things, three things. Number one, no, understand that it's kind of like wallowing in self-pity, and I mean that in the most loving way. I'm not trying to take away your pain, but there's a difference between, God, I, I don't want to be this way, and I, I know I'm going to do everything to grow, and I'm just horrible and miserable. No one will ever love me. Poor me. There really is a difference. And male or female, we all have shame about this behavior. Do you think I don't have shame about all the partners I had and the behaviors that I did? I understand that women have a different kind of shame, that you guys are sluts and we're studs. I get that, that we're players and you're whore. I get how the culture looks at us. But none of us do these things because we're looking to feel terrible about ourselves. We do them because we're doing the best we can to cope in our lives in the way, the best way we know how. Well, now you have some new ways to cope and you're growing them. I suggest you love yourself for being willing to grow and being willing to take this new path, even being in this room Tonight is a, well, it's this morning here, but tonight for you, um, even being willing to be in this room tonight is saying that you want to grow and be a better person. Look at that part instead of all of the negatives. This is the process of growth. And you're going to grieve that you're not the woman that you wish you were, that you're not going to be the person or didn't get to be the person that maybe somebody else did. Let yourself grieve that, but don't do it by hating yourself. It's not worthwhile. I think one of the things that was really helpful for me was to understand that because I had, the, I'm the most horrible, worst person, you know, the whole um, shame spiral. And it was helpful for me to understand that my behavior was pretty typical for a female alcoholic. But, you know, if I, if I looked at it in context of other people that were in my similar situation, you know, I, I really kind of was very normal versus I'm the worst horrible human being on the planet. So, so I think part of um, reducing the shame is be with other people, you know, I mean, then you start laughing at the stories and just go, okay, that's crazy. We did that, but you know, oh, well, so, and what can I learn from it now? And I don't want to repeat that. That was a lot of it. It gave me 
the uh, motivation to not go back to that. So, okay. and, and I want to say, just to throw out a little 12 step comment, mm -hmm. which is, it is very clear if you go to 12 step meetings that we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know no peace. peace. And it also talks about the things that we hated ourselves for will eventually become something that we can use to help others. The fact that I did all of that crappy sexual behavior makes me an extraordinarily good person to talk to you about it because I have no shame about any of this. That means I'm glad to talk to you about any of it because I'm there. I was there too. So give yourself a break and understand you're on a journey that will bring you probably far more happiness than you ever could have found um, um, by remaining lost. Next question. My SA husband went into recovery oops, spilled down, uh, six months ago and has been doing everything perfectly, quotes, 12-step groups, therapy, journaling, et cetera. But the first thing our therapist told him six months ago was to get off Facebook. He said he would give it up. I am starting to trust again and hope again. But today I saw that he was back on Facebook. He hadn't told me. Should I take this seriously or is this minor? Um, this is a major breach of trust. It is not minor. I don't know whether he's just, chatting. he may just be, you know, looking up um, how his friends from high school are doing on Facebook. It doesn't matter what he's doing there. I know you're worried about it, but I'm more worried about the fact that he's lying to you, broke a commitment. This is not, this is exactly what we are not supposed to do as partners when we're trying to regain trust. If he wanted to go back on Facebook to talk to high school friends, he should have said to you, hey, but you already know that his therapist said he shouldn't be on Facebook. So if it were me, I would say, honey, I want to go to therapy next week, next week with you. Could you give your therapist a call? I'd like to have a couple session with them. You, uh, I, and, or I would say, honey, I'd like to get on the phone and let your therapist know, or could you please let your therapist know in front of me on the phone that you're back on Facebook and that it's really upsetting to me. I would want to make sure that that message got across to the therapist from me. Now, if the therapist sees you as intrusive and difficult and why are they trying, or your husband says, well, that's my therapy, say, call bullshit on that because he has broken his contract with you and you have a right to say, hey, I see a warning sign and I'm really unhappy about it. This is, if he gets away with this, it's one step more toward him returning to his behavior if he hasn't already. So this is a big red flag and I would pay attention to it. You're absolutely right. And, and your, suspe I'm sorry, your suspicion is that he got off of Facebook, but that would be something to investigate also is, did he ever really get off of Facebook? Did you just happen to catch him now? So he may or may not have ever really left Facebook. So all of that great to explore with the therapist. So, okay. My SA husband is slowly making progress on his recovery, even on items he commits to doing. Sometimes it feels like two steps forward and one step back. I am frustrated that he is choosing to skip the activities that make him uncomfortable, such as socializing with friends, and it makes me question the commitment to healing. Do you have any advice to get him over the hump or help me be more patient? Well, two things. I mean, a couple of things. First of all, I wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse, a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. And if you haven't read the book, and I, you know, I, you probably may, you may or may not know this, but authors make about 50 cents for every book. So give me that 50 cents and go out there and get out of the doghouse, read it because I wrote a book about how, where men should be coming from when they have betrayed a woman and what it takes for them to heal a relationship with a woman when they have cheated. I did this because I've worked with men for 25 years who've cheated on women who are clueless about, not that they don't desire to, but are clueless about what they really need to do and about the degree of pain they've caused and about how long it takes them to heal. Um, there's another piece of that question I wanted to answer. Um, uh, Tammy, can you read it again really quick? Sorry. Sure. It was, I'm frustrated that it's, it feels like two steps forward, one step oh, right. back. I'm frustrated okay. that he's choosing to skip activities. Right. So here's, here's the other piece. Um, and, I, and this is sometimes a little bit on partners. So this is, if he is going to meetings, working in therapy, um, paying attention to you, being honest, you know, if all the other stuff is working, but he's still, you know, sometimes partners expect um, that after what we've put you through, that we're going to get over all of our personality and emotional challenges as soon as we get into recovery. And while we may stop sexually acting out, we may stop hopefully with the porn and all that stuff, 
and we start being honest and real, it doesn't mean that, in fact, it may be more the case that other things come up. So if he's a particularly shy guy and he really struggles with reaching out, well, heck, if he's going to meetings, 12-step meetings, or he's in a therapy group, he's having to work on that anyway. So I would gauge m my comfort level with, with recovery, not on whether he's necessarily socializing with our friends so much, but more on do I see him being honest, being trustworthy, showing up for the family, doing the thing he needs to do for recovery, and at least, you know, hey, the holidays are coming, honey, will you meet me halfway? I know you're uncomfortable in social situations. Would you go to 50% of what I go to? And the other half, I'll go with a girlfriend. If he's willing to do that, great. You know, then he's at least trying. So I don't expect us, us recovering guys, to show up perfectly for you. Um, and I'm not saying you're ex expecting perfection. But maybe some of the things you expect may not be doable. And believe me, you guys know that I'm willing to call a guy out on, on not being in recovery. But... But that may be more an issue of his personal development than it is a sign that he's not doing well. It depends on how he's doing and all the other stuff. Okay, next question. My SA husband and I are almost three months into recovery after two years of his continuous acting out with sex workers. And even though he's really trying, I really don't feel like he gets the magnitude of his betrayal of me and our marriage and family and whole life. He gets defensive instead of taking ownership and being humble and empathetic. When will he get it? What tips can you give me on how to productively communicate the depths of my hurt and rage? Tips on how he can work to cultivate an empathetic heart and mind so he gets it and doesn't do it again. Okay, I, I, I do not mean to sell anything here, but this is exactly the reason why I wrote this book, Out of the Doghouse. Your husband doesn't realize that he's in the doghouse, that he has certain things, that he, and I use that as a metaphor for he has hurt the relationship. In my view, and what I wrote about in the book is that you guys are no longer equal. He is one down to you because he has betrayed your trust. You're not equal in the relationship right now. He has to be overly attentive, overly trustworthy, over, he has to really push to show up for the relationship. Now, it may be that he doesn't know how to do that. So here's a simple way to solve it. Go buy Out of the Doghouse, I Will Make 50 Cents, give him the book, throw him the book, make him read the book. If you gave him the book, he read the book, then I think a conversation is needed, which is, what did you get out of that? What did you see that I needed? What are, because it, no, no man could read that book. Here, I'll give you, so I'm, I'm reading the person who. Oh, uh, person. Robbie Froze, you said that you bought the book. He says he's read it. I'm thinking he might need to reread it. Rob, she says that he bought the book. He says he's read it. Um, and I said, maybe he needs to go reread it or certain sections. Maybe you go and say, you need to read the uh, section. I don't know. I, okay, so let me tell you how powerful that book is. I've given that book to men who divorced 25 years ago, who, you know, because they were having an affair and married someone else or their affair partner. They have read, read this book and come to me and said, you know, now that I look at how I acted, I think 25 years ago, I could have saved my first marriage if I'd only known how. That's how powerful this book is. I've had women come to me after 25 years after the affair and say, I didn't realize how hurt I was. I didn't realize how little or how much my man did to make it better because it is that you cannot, and you read this book, you can't read that book without understanding what your partner's going through. I am concerned now that your partner is not developing empathy for you. You froze again, and, Rob. Oops. I did read the book. It's very powerful. There's two versions for those that come from a Christian standpoint. There is one with um, co-author Marnie for. Oops. Hey, Tammy. Hello. I know, guys, we're going to freeze like this. Unfortunately, we, well, not for, unfortunately, we're in Thailand. Um, for those of you not aware, um, we're looking at opening a treatment center here on the other side of the world. And we're also trying to promote recovery here. So um, it may be difficult for us both to be on screen and for both of us to work, but we'll do our best. 
um, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, out of the doghouse. And I think, you know, again, I, I am very worried when I don't hear somebody expressing empathy. So let me tell you something um, that is a little uh, therapy secret, okay? Narcissistic people lack empathy. Addicts lack empathy. All addicts are narcissistic by nature because we pursue our pleasures over the empathy we might have for our partner. But when confronted, people who are narcissistic usually develop remorse. We feel bad. We may not in advance feel bad for how we're going to hurt you when we go have that affair. But once we see you crying and upset about the affair, we get it. However, people who are sociopathic or who have psychopathy don't feel remorse. They just wish you'd get over it. And that fact that he read a book that powerful and doesn't seem any different than before makes me worry about your husband. Does he have the capacity to feel badly about what he has done to you? If he does not have that capacity, this will not heal. And I'm not sure you're in the best relationship. There's a great book I suggest you read. It's called The Sociopath Next Door. I know all of you will jump to this and say, my husband is a sociopath. That's not true. People who feel badly about their behavior and want to correct it are not sociopathic. People who are in denial about the extent of their behavior and need a good shove so they wake up and say, oh my God, I could lose everything, and they get to work, they're not sociopathic. But people who again and again are confronted with the pain that they've caused a partner or anyone and the hurt that they're continuing to cause, who continue to say, I don't care, it's your problem, they may have the problem and it may be much more profound than you realize. There's a book called The Sociopath Next Door. He's trying, but it's not sinking in. Trying is not good enough. Um, here's something else, and I think it's worth saying. Um, there are people who have other underlying emotional issues. For example, I have a fair amount of depression. I've been on meds for many years. It's something I'll struggle with all of my life. Had I not been diagnosed and properly treated, I would be much more reactive, much more angry, much more irritable. In fact, you might take a look. I wrote a book, uh, sorry, I wrote a blog for Psychology Today about, on depression in men. Depression in men often looks like irritability, anger, arrogance, um, um, leave me alone, that's how we get when we don't always get lie in bed, sad, crying. Um, we can sometimes, but depression in men can often look angry. So it could be that your husband is so caught up in his own emotional challenges, and it isn't a personality issue, that he might need something for depression or for an anxiety. There's another book I would suggest you read, anyone might want to read, on men and depression. It's by a friend of mine named Terry Real, and the book is called I Don't Want to Talk About It. And it's about um, depression in men that, that shows up as anger, irritability, and, all, and frustration, even when they shouldn't be acting that way. So, you know, on the one hand, the bad news might be your husband could have a profound personality challenge that leaves him unable to truly be remorseful. He can try, but he doesn't really feel it. And that would be a big deal. The other possibility is that, um, oh, if, uh, to find the blog post, post just write it, uh, go Google, my name, Rob Weiss, Depression, Men, Psychology Today. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, anyway, uh, I would also say, so, you know, either you ha he has a profound personality problem, which is a bigger issue, or he's just so caught up in his own emotional pain that he just really can't get to yours, even if he wants to. And that would be something to really have, uh, have him maybe uh, get some evaluation for. Tammy, you faded out, but you're back. Do you have I'm more back. questions? I'm back. I do. I have accumulated a lot of handwritten notes and journaling and disclosure details over the past two years tied to counseling. The details of my actions, thoughts, and sexual history are very personal and confidential. Is there a point in my road to fully recover um, after mutually agreeing with my counselor to cease counseling and after fully going through 12 steps? I want to comment on yeah. that. But, but I yeah, can delete and destroy most, if not all, of these details are you my past addict self. I'm worried that if I were to die and others were to see these personal documents 
Can you um, maybe refine that question for me? Because I'm not sure I fully understand. So this person has handwritten a lot of information of the details of their sexual history. And the concern is that it's confidential. And were something to happen to them unexpectedly, then this would be made uh, available to those left. So wanting to know if there's a time frame in which um, that could be disposed of. Yeah. I actually agree with you. I don't know how old you are, but I've heard the stories, Tammy and I both have, of this, the person who passed away unexpectedly and their spouse or their children or their grandchildren found all this stuff and it was just horrifying. So, you know, I, I did journaling for years and years when I needed to in early recovery. I, have sta I had stacks this big, but at a certain point I thought, you know, these words need to be put aside. I, I, this is my past. And some people burn them in a kind of ceremony with, with other people around and say, this is my, I don't think you need to keep that stuff. You've reviewed it. You've looked at it. You've worked on it. It's not like it is in your head. Um, I would find a way of disposing it um, that leaves you feeling safe, but also if possible in some kind of ceremonial way that is sort of like casting the past and kind of cleaning, you know, clearing a line toward the future. Yeah, that's, I love that. And, and have been part of those kind of ceremonies as well. Um, I think it's very healing um, because it's so easy to go back into the shame thing or, you know, keep revisiting that. So if you're doing all of those things, you know, I think making it a celebration of, of moving into the next phase of your journey would be great. But hey, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to yeah. say something before we, um, we have time for a couple of more questions and we have about 35 people here. I just want to let you guys know what we're doing very briefly, um, and I would appreciate your honoring that. Um, we're, I'm, you know, I'm a, a, a doctor and have been in this field a very long time and written a whole bunch of books, and you would pay a lot of money to see me um, um, because I, my time is valuable now. I've worked hard and I've earned that. And I'm giving this time for free because I know that I had no one to ask questions of until I could afford to go see somebody fancy to get the information I needed. And some people may never get that. So my goal and my commitment to you is to be available online for free. And I'm here uh, almost every, except when I'm traveling, almost every Monday night at five o'clock California time. Um, and that's 8 a.m. in Thailand. <laughs> and uh, I'm also on intherooms.com, which is a more general site for addictions, every Friday night California time at six o'clock. I do this work for free, number one, for service. It's part of my healing to keep giving the message out and supporting you. But I, what we're also doing this because we're trying to build a community on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. Um, nothing we do on that site has any cost to anyone. There's no charge. There's no price. All of it is free and all of it is anonymous to access. So the only thing I ask of you is go to our website, spread the word, let people know that we're doing this work. We have podcasts. Sex, Love, and Addiction is the podcast. That's also free. Some of you asked about my blog on Psychology Today. I've been writing for six years. I'm a top five Psychology Today blogger because I write about love and sex. And guess what everyone wants to talk about? So, you know, if you want to learn more, go back into the, just put in, uh, look up Rob Weiss, Psychology Today, and you'll find all of my blogs and my history. Um, there's lots of resources that we are trying to offer to you for free because we believe that's the best way to get recovery to you. So. I ask for your, I don't ask for a penny or any financial support. The only thing I ask is that you spread the word about the work we're doing so that other people can find us. And with well, that, and, let's take Well, I'm going to tag on because those drop-in groups, um, for those of you here, there are drop-in groups. And I'm, you know, I've been trying, so I haven't uh, participated in a, in a few of them, but uh, there's a partners drop-in group with um, Brittany. There's a. Uh, the partners drop-in group is Wednesdays, not every Wednesday, but Wednesday at 1230 Pacific time. Um, it's on the schedule on sex and relationship healing.com. Joe has a men's um, sex addiction drop-in group Mondays at 1045 AM Pacific time. Um, and there's, there's my uh, Miro has one, uh, a gay men's drop-in group on Wednesdays at 5 PM alternating Wednesdays. Um, uh, from David Emmy, Fawcett's Emmy webinar. Brilliant. So so there's lots of resources. If you haven't already registered on sex and relationship healing.com, invite you to do that. Um, uh, and that's, you can find the podcast, you can find blogs, you can find the links to all of that information just from that site. So, okay, we were, so ready for we the next question? To grow this website because we're trying yes. to grow. Are you there, Rob? Uh, Did you freeze? <laughs>
So we both freeze Rob? about the same. We freeze about the same time, Tammy. Just so you know, you're frozen, but okay. I'm not. Okay. So um, does it seem likely that a sex addict husband who claims to be in recovery would still have the city of the women who cheated with him in two of three weather apps that they have been on their phone after three years? Of they're finding out about their affair lifestyle. This husband still has the city of their affair partner on their phone. When confronted in the first lie, he was, I didn't put the city on my phone. It was preset, which isn't true. And then that became, well, I believed it was a preset and on and on. Given he lied for years and years and years, this is hard to believe. What are your thoughts? Well, I just shared mine. So. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I hate it when addicts will argue about the tiniest little piece of turf that they want to hold on to. But this seems like such, this actually concerns me because it's such a minor issue. Why didn't you just say, yeah, I used to check up on my girlfriend's weather because when I used to travel to see her, you know, I wanted to see if it was sunny or raining and I'm not seeing her anymore, so I'll take it off. I don't understand, as you don't, why I can't do that simple thing? So guess what, folks? When addicts are pushing away something simple like that, it becomes a really big thing. And I absolutely support you in saying, this is now not a little thing because you've made it into a really big thing. And that then becomes, uh, we need to talk about this in therapy. We need to get through this. I'm not moving further. In other words, you, you are absolutely right to escalate. I, I, you know, when I first heard this, I thought, come on, really a weather app? I mean, you know, people, have, but it's not that he had it there, it's the way he talked about it, that he defended it in the way he did. That's what concerns me. Now, I wanna to say to everyone in the room that I understand that sometimes spouses in their emotional state will um, overly read into things. And certainly, you know, the fact that someone's looking at a weather in another city doesn't mean that he's actually going there and meeting with someone. But when someone says that didn't mean anything, or I didn't really do that, well, I kind of did, okay, it was preloaded, well, it wasn't, that's all bullshit, you know? So if you're not hearing the truth, um, that concerns me much more than whatever he's looking at. And why is he being so defensive about something so simple? I would be concerned. And, and we brother, noted... I'm sorry, bring him on here. <laughs> bring your husband on here next week when I'm here and or in the rooms and ask him that question while we're on here. Lay, uh, those of you who have partners, you can come on here as couples and you can argue it out in front of us. I am perfectly, uh, perfectly glad for a spouse to say, I don't like this. And what about that? And the next question is the husband or wife saying, well, I feel this way. I think that's a great for couples to be on here and you know, um, giving us both sides of the story is a fabulous way for us to educate you. So don't feel like you, this is just a resource for you. Please bring it to your partner, whether an addict or a spouse. Yeah, um, Tammy, please. Well, no, it was just that, and the claims they are in recovery. I mean, it's really easy to say you're in recovery, but actions speak louder than words. You know, are they, you know, going to 12 step meetings? What are their three circle, you know, boundaries? You know, what, what, what do they have? What is the plan? Are they talking to their sponsor? You know, did they call their sponsor when you confronted them about the weather app? You know, I mean, there's so many ways to find out if they really are in recovery. And, and remember, I want to say to everybody that, um, two things, and I want to say this every time. I don't know how many spouses are in the room, but I want you to hear this. Um, and I'm an addict, okay? I want you guys to love us and forgive us and think that we're just the best thing since sliced bread. That's what I want for my partner. That's what I want you to feel about your partners and them for you. But I need to say this. There is never anything that any of you spouses can do to make us go have sex or an affair with another person. You may not have sex with us. You may gain 300 pounds. You may focus on our kids. You may leave us. You can do whatever you think you need to do for you, right or wrong, good or bad. I may hate you. I can get a divorce lawyer. I can go to therapy. I can go horseback riding or, you know, go help some child in Bangladesh. Those are all a lot. I have many, many options to me when I'm unhappy to you, with you or with you, what you're saying or doing other than sexually act out. If I choose to sexually act out because of something you did, that's my choice, not anything that you did. I will blame you. I will put it on you in my head. I will say that you're the problem. And sadly, sometimes as a partner, you will believe that. But no alcoholic ever drank because their partner made them miserable. They drank because they wanted to. And no sex addict ever acts out because you did anything. We act out because we want to justify, rationalize, and then go do what we want to do. Um, that doesn't mean that you get to abuse us, but it does mean that when you, when, need, when you need something, we should respond. You know, I have 
here's, here's how far along I am with this issue. If you're in the first 60 days of recovery and your wife or husband wants to GPS track you all day long, I think that's perfectly fine. And why wouldn't it be if they've lied to you for 10 years and you want 60 days of reassurance that they actually are where they are when they say they are, that's being one down, that's being in the doghouse, that I'm willing to do whatever it takes within reason to show up for your relationship, my relationship with you. Um, so partners, I know that we get really angry and upset and hurt. We're tired of your irritability. We're tired of your throwing it in our faces. We're tired, we're ashamed, we wish it would go away. But that should inspire us to be better people, not to tell you to give us a break or leave it alone or stop bugging us. Um, I think we have time for one more. One more question. Is it possible for both partners in a relationship to be addicts? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, all kinds of, in fact, I would say it's possible for partners to have multiple addictions. Um, you can have someone with an eating disorder and problems who, someone who has problems with eating and drinking involved with pro someone who has problems with sex and gambling. And sometimes they gamble and eat and so it, we can have all kinds of co-occurring addictions. Um, so, and, and it's possible, very possible for both partners to be sex addicts. I, I think the only book I wrote about that in is, is Cruise Control, the book for gay men, because it's not unusual for two gay men together who've been acting out together to find that both of them have issues in this area. But it happens with straight couples too. Um, yeah, sure. And if you have paired addictions as a couple, what a great opportunity for you to be learning the same lessons at the same time. Um, you in your meetings, him and her, and him and his, and, and maybe in some couples. So um, at Al-Anon or something like that. So yeah, get those things out of the way, line them all up and start shooting, them, shoot, shooting at them. And, uh, and by the way, almost all of us struggle with multiple issues. It's not maybe full on addictions, but you know, if you have a problem managing your anxiety or managing stress or managing your emotions and you, and you sexually act out to relieve the anxiety, you know, it's not unlikely you might want to eat or drink or gamble to relieve that same anxiety once you stop acting out sexually. The time to really look for multiple addictions is when one is put down and then you look at the rest of your life and you say, hey, is there anything else that's compulsive or addictive that is interfering with my life? Or is there anything that's popped up that I didn't expect? Um, one more thing, folks. I, um, in the a uh, couple, two things. The drop-in groups that are starting to happen on sex and relationship healing, those are not like this group. In those groups, you're going to be, your faces are up if you choose to be like Tammy and mine. You're there to talk to each other. The goal of the drop-in groups is not that some therapist is going to deliver the word and we're going to heal you. We're not allowed to do therapy online. That is illegal. What we are creating is educational support spaces for you to sit and join with each other and support each other. That's the community piece. So when you go to a drop-in group for wives or for addicts, you hopefully will see each other. We are not recording those sessions. Those are completely confidential. We pay someone to sit there and monitor the group and you get to go for free. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about that work. Um, anything else, Tommy, or else I just wanna say, love talking to you from the other side of the world and I look forward to being back in the States next week and getting back to the work that we do. Thank you all for attending. Bye. We'll see you in a week. Look forward to it, bye for now.